Welcome into the program. Boy, there is a lot to go through today, and it all has to do with the president's address. President Donald Trump, of course, addressing the nation last night. And I did want to, before we get into it, and I know this is probably a backwards way of doing things, but I think that it actually is going to work and, and work uh, well for you. So my overall thoughts, I'm going to go ahead and give those before I get into my breakdown. And we're going to go through it, not quite line by line, but Uh, certainly talking point by talking point and idea by idea. So we're going to go over that and and give you sort of an idea of uh, not only the raw argument, but also the political fallout, how this is going to affect them. And that really comes to my overall impression of what was going on here. I think that in a sense, this was a good thing to do because it allows us to have a deeper conversation about it. But I don't think if you're talking about politically, this thing is going to move the needle, at least not very much. And so this is really where I I come into to having a few problems with this. It's not that I thought that it was wrong or that when it came to Trump's address, I thought that there was anything that was necessarily bad. It's just more of a, I don't know how productive it is. Now, there's an angle where I think that maybe it can be productive, and we'll get to that in a second, but uh, just overall, my first impression is, while I don't think there was anything wrong with it, I don't know that this actually does anything to move the average voter, the person that was on the fence, into one camp or the other. Now, one thing that was a little unusual is that President Donald Trump went out and he did his presentation there in the Oval Office. And then you had Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer offer a rebuttal or a response or whatever you want to call it directly afterward. That's something that's very odd. It's not something that the opposing party normally does after a presidential address, but they felt that they needed to, and we're going to break that down as well. So what I want to discuss first is the lead up to this. So I'm not going to give you all the context because if you keep up with the news or if you've been watching this program, you already know all of that. So what I want to talk about is that I was watching the CNN coverage on the way in, that I was watching all the lead up and build up to this big thing. And the commentators, I thought, were really hilarious because in the minutes before the coverage actually started, you saw the commentators kind of just sitting there and agreeing and nodding their heads with one another on a couple of points. And one thing that I thought was really odd about that is that the commentator said that because Trump was trying to make the shutdown as painless as possible, he was de-incentivizing the shutdown. And that's using their phrase, not mine. And so I thought this was kind of humorous because (laughs) I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so what you're saying is because Trump is doing what he can for the welfare programs and the other things that people depend on to try to keep them more or less running while the shutdown is going on, that's what you're criticizing him for because they said that he was de-incentivizing Congress to end the shutdown. In other words, making it more painless than it would be normally so that Congress would not have a reason to go ahead and get the government running again. First of all, I don't buy into that. I think that when the president says that he doesn't actually want to shut down, he doesn't want the government shut down, he just wants the the funding that he that he wants, I tend to believe him on that. Not because I think that Trump is by any means infallible or that he doesn't lie or anything like that, but he doesn't really have a motive to want the shutdown to last longer than it is. The biggest win that he could get is to just go ahead and get the funding that he needed and then call it a day and say, yeah, I won, and beat his chest and do his usual Trump thing and talk about how great he is and how he's made America great again. So really, the shutdown being extended is not something that works in his favor to an extent. But here's the issue that I'm I'm running into. I imagine what would happen if the opposite took place. Because you'll remember the opposite strategy took place when Barack Obama was in office. I mean, Barack Obama actually spent more money then it would have cost him to just let the government stay shut down and actually hired people to go out and make this process as painful as humanly possible. A great example is the World War II Memorial. 
The World War II Memorial is an open memorial, which, by the way, was funded with private donations. I mean, I believe that the maintenance and upkeep is something that is primarily held by the federal government, but as far as the, the monument being built there, that was done by private donations. That was not the federal government's doing. And I could maybe even understand them turning off the water feature because, you know, it's water, it's city water, and it's not very expensive, but it costs some money. But they actually went out and put barriers around the monument to try to keep people from going and seeing the monument. Uh, they were closing down roads that you would have to go to for national parks. And when it came to even federal funding for local things there in D.C., there were Obama hired people to go out and lock up swing sets, to place padlocks around swing sets in public playgrounds for kids. I mean, Obama's policy was you make it as hard as humanly possible on these people because I want them to know how much the government does for them. I want them to feel the effects of the shutdown as much as possible so that they have a motivation to go ahead and end that. And of course, Mitch McConnell did what he always did, which is surrender and quickly gave up once that started happening. And so if you're looking at history, very, very different approaches by these two presidents. And what's hilarious about that is if Donald Trump did that, if Donald Trump actually spent more money and hired people to go out and try to make the government shut down feel more painful than it actually needed to be, specifically to get his way on it, the media would have destroyed him on that and probably should have. Because I got no problem with the government being shut down for a few days. You guys know I'm a libertarian. That's not really something that's super scary to me. I think that Congress should fully fund the government whenever they should. And again, my solution was just pass a dang budget so this doesn't become a conversation. We don't have to worry about continuing resolutions. But nonetheless, if Congress had just done its job according to the Constitution, we wouldn't have this problem. But, but nonetheless, take that out of it for a second whether or not I personally am, am terrified of a shutdown or not, you're looking at two very different approaches by two very different presidents. And if Trump had taken the same approach that Obama did, the media would have just gone after him to no end, talking about how heartless he is and how he's just cruel and evil and trying to make people feel the effects of this more than they really should. I mean, can you imagine the media's coverage of that? And so the irony is it didn't matter what Trump did, the media was going to go after him. It didn't matter what Trump did, the media was going to assume that he's the one in the wrong and go after him for the way that he's handling it. So if he makes the uh, if he makes this painless as possible, if he tries to fund all the welfare programs, he tries to make sure that everybody that needs funding, that needs these things, has them, then he's a bad guy for making it painless and allowing the government to go on unfunded as long as possible. And then if he does nothing, or worse, if he did what Barack Obama did, he actually tries to make it more painful, then all of a sudden you've got the media covering him in such a way that they're saying, well, this guy's just a monster. He's trying to make it as painful as he can, or he just doesn't care about these people. And so that's the thing that is ironic about this. And they kept saying that he lacks sympathy despite this, despite the fact that they are admitting on TV that he was actually trying to make the transition as painless as humanly possible and to mitigate the effects of the shutdown. They say, well, he lacks empathy. He's just doing it for himself. Well, again, that's attributing motive and you don't know that. And this is what the, the kind of thing that people are talking about when they are upset with quote unquote fake news. And if he had put the screws to people the way Obama did in his shutdown, you would have seen a very different reaction by the media was a different reaction by the media um, in this sense, in the way that they reacted this time. They would have just taken the opposite, but Trump still would have been the bad guy, and a very different reaction than they did when they were covering the shutdown from Obama's standpoint. Because when that happened, the way that they covered it is they were blaming Republicans for that, even though it was the executive branch that ordered those things to be done. And so another thing that was interesting in the lead-up to all of this is that they had a hashtag going out called Boycott Trump. Or Boycott the Trump Address, I think, was the actual text of the, the boycott. So hashtag Boycott Trump Address. That was one thing that I noticed that was trending on Twitter and got a lot of follows. And this thing is just laughable to me. There were a lot of people that didn't want Trump to do this address, that they didn't want him to address the issue. If you really believe that he's a bozo and he's 
just a, a moron and he doesn't have an argument and he can't make the case of the American people, then what you need to do is let him talk. I've never understood this mentality that you don't want your opponent to talk because the thing is, I believe in my message. I believe that I'm right and I believe that they're wrong. And because of that, I believe that because they are wrong, the more they talk, the better it is for me. I've never understood this mentality, and I guess it's just because I'm a debater. But if you really believe that you're right and the other person is wrong, then why wouldn't you want them to talk? If you really believed that what President Trump was going to do is get on national TV and lie to the entire nation, lie through his teeth, lie about everything, then you should want that to take place. You should want that to happen so he can be put on display and everybody can see it. And so what really I think this is an indication of is the people that were supporting this boycott Trump address thing, they were people that were really terrified that what was going to happen is that Donald Trump was actually going to make a compelling case of the American people. That's what they didn't want. And that's what they were afraid was going to happen because otherwise there would be no sense in them boycotting the address. And another thing too, it's such a total snowflake move for them to take the stance that, well, I don't even agree with the guy, so I don't want to hear what he has to say. Look, I disagreed with Barack Obama on practically everything, and I still watched every single address that he ever made, any big speech that he was going to make. I always listened to it, and part of that was because I didn't agree with him and I wanted to keep an eye on him. And so even if you absolutely despise Trump, think he's a Nazi, and all these other stupid things that people call him, I don't understand this idea of why you wouldn't want to listen to them. Because if you really believe he has all these bad, terrible, horrible things, then you shouldn't be sticking your fingers in your ears and going, ah, la, 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 la. No, you should want to hear what he's got to say so that you know what's coming down the pipeline. And it's just such a, it's such a snowflake move because the, at the sign of any heat whatsoever, they immediately melt. That's the reason that they're called snowflakes. Because the second they hear anything that kind of remotely interrupts their worldview or is something that they kind of disagree with, they just can't handle it and they want to remove themselves from the situation. If you want to be an adult, if you want to be someone who is conscientious and actually thinks about issues, then you should be a fan of more information, not less. So let's actually get into the meat and potatoes of the address last night. Uh, the address took place in the Oval Office, which I thought was probably the best place for it. I mean, I would say that it is the second best or the second most intimidating place a person can be. The presidential power sort of oozes from the Oval Office. I think the only place that he probably seems as though he's in more authority is at the bottom of the steps of Air Force One. And that's not really a great place to do a speech, especially in an address to the nation. So it made sense that he decided on the Oval Office. I'm not a big fan of the speeches that take place out in the hallway behind a podium. Nothing wrong with it per se, but I think sitting behind the president's desk, the resolute desk in the Oval Office, I mean, you have the place of authority when you're doing that. And so from a political standpoint, whether I agree with the message or not, just observing from a political standpoint, that was a good place for the president to make his case. And so this is the case that he makes. We'll go ahead and listen to this. This is the first clip of the president addressing the nation last night. America proudly welcomes millions of lawful immigrants who enrich our society and contribute to our nation. But all Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal migration. It strains public resources and drives down jobs and wages. Among those hardest hit are African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Our southern border is a pipeline for vast quantities of illegal drugs, including meth, heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. Every week, 300 of our citizens are killed by heroin alone, 90 percent of which floods across from our southern border. More Americans will die from drugs this year than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. In the last two years, ICE officers made 266,000 arrests of aliens with criminal records including those charged or convicted of 100,000 assaults, 30,000 sex crimes, and 4,000 violent killings. Over the years, thousands of Americans have been brutally killed by those who illegally entered our country 
and thousands more lives will be lost if we don't act right now. This is a humanitarian crisis, a crisis of the heart and a crisis of the soul. Last month, 20,000 migrant children were illegally brought into the United States, a dramatic increase. These children are used as human pawns by vicious coyotes and ruthless gangs. One in three women are sexually assaulted on the dangerous trek up through Mexico. Women are children are the biggest victims, by far, of our broken system. This is the tragic reality of illegal immigration on our southern border. This is the cycle of human suffering that I am determined to end. So the president there making a, a very, very compelling case. And one of the things that I thought was very smart for him to bring up is that, and, and it's true, I mean, it's not as though he's just making this up. Even the fact checkers kind of went along with him on this, that typically what happens is the victims of illegal immigration are not rich people, are not necessarily people that are in the majority, at least demographically speaking. Minorities, including blacks and Hispanics and poor people, tend to be hurt most by illegal immigration. And if you're talking about the women and children on the border, those are the ones that are getting hurt the most by illegal immigration as well. Some of the horror stories that you'll hear about women fleeing with their children and paying a coyote to smuggle them across, and then they get there, and then when they're about halfway there, they stall and, and you know, either sexually assault, rape, whatever you want to say. I mean, some of these stories are just absolutely awful. And the reason that that situation is allowed to take place is because we have very loose immigration. Now, they would probably still make attempts if we had a wall up and if we had border security and, and proper border security. But the point is, is those, those situations would be mitigated. They would be far less in number if it was very, very difficult to get across because there would be less smugglers willing to do so. And this is really, it speaks to the bigger problem with illegal immigration. Americans have a problem with illegal immigration because we have a certain innate sense of what is right and wrong. Sometimes it goes awry. Don't get me wrong. It happens. But on this, I think the reason that that takes place and what it really stems from is this idea that everybody should have the same rules and everybody should play by those rules. Illegal immigration just thumbs its nose at the rule of law. Whether you agree with it or not, whether you think that you know America is some evil, horrible, imperialistic country that discriminates against minorities, and because of that, we should bear the cost of illegal immigration, which again, kind of is a self-contradictory view to take, because if it really is an evil, racist country, then why are so many people trying to get here? <laughs> so a contradictory worldview, but let's just say that you do hold that worldview. Well, illegal immigration is still creating thousands upon thousands of victims every single year through drugs, child sex trafficking, human trafficking, um, you know, just some of the abuses that are going on here are horrible. And this is something that I've said from the very beginning, because there is an unfair assumption. There is this very unfair assumption about Donald Trump and really anybody that supports a border wall. This assumption did not start with Donald Trump. It predates Trump's political career, because people have been saying this about me and other conservatives for years that support a strong border security program. They'll say that the reason that you're doing that is just because you're afraid of brown people coming across the border, which is monumentally stupid, but let's just say for the sake of argument, let's just say that they're right. Let's just say that all the people that are in favor of the border wall are racist and they don't want brown people coming through the country. That is still not actually a good reason for opposing the border wall. And here's why I'm going to use this little illustration. For example, there are certain policies that certain people that I vehemently disagree with on almost every issue politically happen to agree with me on. The homosexual community, for example, they were against the Defense of Marriage Act and they were against a constitutional amendment to define marriage as a man and a woman. And you know what? So was I. Now, our motivations were very different. The reason that they 
wanted to not have a constitutional amendment that defines marriage as a man and a woman is because they wanted gay marriage to be a thing. They wanted the state to acknowledge that a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman. That's not the motivation that I had. The reason that I didn't want that to take place is because mankind has no business defining what marriage is. That is God's territory, and he clearly defines it in the scripture over and over again as being between a man and a woman. And as such, this is a church issue. I don't want the government involved in a church-sanctioned institution like marriage for the same reason I don't want them involved in a church-sanctioned institution like baptism, the eldership, the deaconhood, who gets to preach there, all those other things. I see this as the state encroaching upon the church's territory. And I'm not going to go through all the arguments on that. I've done it many, many times on the show. But suffice it to say, the reason that I bring that up is you see how two groups that are very different, me being a very religious sort of libertarian-leaning conservative, and them, the LGBT community, want the same policy but for very, very different reasons. And so this is the case that I would make to people that whenever you bring this subject up, they say, oh, well, the people that, that want the border wall, they're just a bunch of racists that are afraid of brown people. Okay, even if that's true, and I don't think it is, but even if it happens to be true, that's still not a good reason for being against a border wall just because there are other people you happen to disagree with that are also for a border wall. If there is a real problem, and Trump just laid out what the problems are, if there is a real problem going on at the border, a real humanitarian crisis, and the border wall would help secure that, would help mitigate that to some degree, it makes no sense for you to be against the border wall just because there are people that have bad intentions that are also for a border wall. That makes no sense. I mean, that would be like me saying, oh, well, the gay people are against the Defense of Marriage Act. Guess I need to be for it. No, that does not coincide with my political beliefs. And so just because you happen to agree with someone on policy does not mean you agree with their motives. And so that is a non-starter of an argument. And I will say, and Trump makes this, this case pretty well, these Americans that are not, or sorry, these uh, immigrants that are not playing by the same rules as Americans, they're getting a lot of the benefit without paying in. If you're looking at the net loss, we're losing about 16 uh, sorry, $116 billion a year. So $5.7 billion for a wall that would help mitigate some of that cost is a small price to pay. The wall will wind up paying for itself pretty quickly, and he actually gets into that a little bit later. One guy that tended to lean left, he asked me this question the other day. He says, well, why can't we spend that $5.7 billion on things like education and welfare? Now, I don't think the federal government should spend money on those things, but Let's just put that aside for a second and deal with the argument right in front of us. If we're losing $116 billion a year to benefits going to illegal immigrants that are not citizens, then doesn't it make sense to spend $5.7 billion on a wall today that will wind up paying for itself in the long run? And then what we can do is we'll have more money left over to possibly spend on those programs that he's talking about. It actually is a cost-effective way to handle the problem. And that's something that I, I think a lot of people are missing. And when it comes to women, children, those that are most vulnerable among us, Trump does a very good job there of making the case of why those are the ones that are most vulnerable. And it is unfortunate that it seems like when it comes to Democrat circles, it's usually the people that they purport to be protecting and defending that wind up getting hurt the most. Unfortunately, that seems to be the case right here. So let's go ahead and look at the third clip here. This is just common sense. The border wall would very quickly pay for itself. The cost of illegal drugs exceeds $500 billion a year, vastly more than the $5.7 billion we have requested from Congress. The wall will also be paid for indirectly by the great new trade deal we have made with Mexico. All right, so on this one, Donald Trump doing really great, and he's right about it actually paying for itself. And I just presented that number to you. Now, he does use that $500 billion figure that we're having in heroin, and 90%, he was right on that, 90% of the heroin that comes into the United States comes across the border. 
And so that is a real problem. It needs to be addressed. But I personally would have used that $1.6 billion figure because it's a little bit more tangible. And even though 90% of the heroin is coming across the border, then, you know, that to me, it's harder to attribute all of that in the mind of the average viewer to just happening because of illegal immigration. And so it's a little bit not dishonest per se, but certainly not the best figure that I would have used. I would have preferred to use the one point or the 116 billion figure that I used earlier in the show that we're spending in both federal and state and local taxes for different amenities for illegals. See, that's really the angle that I would have taken on it. But nonetheless, still pretty good. And what he's saying about it paying for itself is accurate. Like I said, the costs that are associated with illegal immigration and not keeping a tighter lid on it has cost us far more than this $5.7 billion and the wall is going to pay for itself pretty quickly. I mean, maybe within just the span of a few years, because it's not going to get rid of the existing illegal immigrants. It's not going to completely make that cost go away, but it is going to start chipping away at it. And I think it wouldn't cost but a few years to be able to knock a serious dent in that $116 billion figure. And so doing that was actually a really good way to bring it to light and explain how I was going to pay for it. What was stupid, however, and this was probably his biggest gaffe of the night, is that he claimed that somehow the USMCA is going to pay for this wall, which is fallacious on a number of levels. First of all, the USMCA doesn't really drastically increase tariffs so it's not going to be something that raises a lot of money. So you could make the argument that maybe it's because there's going to be so much more trade from Mexico, Mexico buying more of our products. But even that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because if I go out and I take you to lunch and I buy your lunch for you, that is me paying for your lunch. In the same way that if Mexico handed us a check to pay for the wall or built the wall themselves, that is them paying for the wall. If I instead walk into your grocery store and buy $80 worth of groceries, well, that money eventually does go to buying your lunch, but it's not like I bought your lunch for you. I bought something of you, something of value from you, and some of the profit off of that you were able to use to buy yourself lunch. That is not the same thing as me paying for your lunch. And so it's this mental gymnastics that the president is trying to do to try to somehow kind of justify his campaign promise of Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Look, he's got to drop this Mexico is going to pay for the wall thing, because every time he talks about it or even alludes to it like this, it comes off as really stupid and somebody that can't let it go. He can't let go of the fact that he was wrong. Mexico is never going to pay for this wall. And I said that way back when he was talking about it in the campaign. There is no way that Mexico winds up paying for even a section of the wall. And so this trying to, to figure out a way to cobble together some form of logic where this is true, I'm sorry, it does not play well for him. And, um, you know, th that was really the only big screw up of the night, though. So I think that we should probably count our blessings when you consider that was the only really dumb thing that he said. And then what he does a little bit later, and we're not going to go into the clips of it because you know what he said. You know what it was like. If you've seen him talk about it before, you don't even have to watch the address to know this. He went from taking all the blame for the shutdown. You remember that in that meeting with Pelosi and Schumer, he said that I'm going to own the shutdown. And then he moved to we're both at fault. And now he's moved all the way to in that address last night. The only reason the government shutdown is continuing to take place is is because the Republicans will not fund border security. Now, is that statement correct? Yes, it is correct. Because if they did fund border security and they accepted the president's proposal, he would sign that bill into law. However, this is another blatant attempt to play the blame game. He is trying to lay all of the blame at the Democrats' feet. And that is not necessarily helpful. It's not productive. It comes off as childish and petty. And I'm going to get on to Pelosi and Schumer because they did exactly the same thing in the rebuttal but we'll get to them in a second. So let's go ahead and look at this last little clip from the president's address last night. Some have suggested a barrier is immoral. Then why do wealthy politicians build walls, fences, and gates around their homes? 
They don't build walls because they hate the people on the outside, but because they love the people on the inside. The only thing that is immoral is the politicians to do nothing and continue to allow more innocent people to be so horribly victimized. America's heart broke the day after Christmas when a young police officer in California was savagely murdered in cold blood by an illegal alien who just came across the border. The life of an American hero was stolen by someone who had no right to be in our country. Day after day, precious lives are cut short by those who have violated our borders. In California, an Air Force veteran was raped, murdered, and beaten to death with a hammer by an illegal alien with a long criminal history. In Georgia, an illegal alien was recently charged with murder for killing, beheading, and dismembering his neighbor. In Maryland, MS-13 gang members who arrived in the United States as unaccompanied minors were arrested and charged last year after viciously stabbing and beating a 16-year-old girl. Over the last several years, I've met with dozens of families whose loved ones were stolen by illegal immigration. I've held the hands of the weeping mothers and embraced the grief-stricken fathers. So sad, so terrible. I will never forget the pain in their eyes, the tremble in their voices, and the sadness gripping their souls. How much more American blood must we shed before Congress does its job? To those who refuse to compromise in the name of border security, I would ask, imagine if it was your child, your husband, or your wife, whose life was so cruelly shattered and totally broken. To every member of Congress, pass a bill that ends this crisis. All right, so this is really where Trump kind of shines. He is really good at calling people out. He is really good at explaining why they have double standards and inconsistencies, which is actually pretty ironic considering that he tends to have quite a bit of double standards and inconsistencies himself. But the point is he's great at pointing it out in other people. And he's pointing out that these politicians that are saying that the wall is immoral, including Nancy Pelosi, who you saw that clip from the other day, it is completely inconsistent. Because she says that the wall is immoral on the border, but basically border walls and walls of any kind everywhere else are perfectly okay. And it really doesn't make any sense, and so he makes a pretty good case for that. And even though he ta tells a lot of personal stories, and some of the stories that have happened and hit the headlines over the past year, I don't typically like anecdotal evidence personally. I'm a facts and numbers guy, and as sad as the story may be, and even though it may appeal to me, it's not really going to move me to action because I realize it may or may not be an outlier. But when you're talking about this, first of all, he already presented the stats that backs up some of these claims. And so the fact that he put the stats out first and then moved to the personal story I thought was smart by the president. But it really does show the compassionate side of the argument. So he starts out with an appeal to logic and gives the stats and gives the numbers and then kind of ends up in this place where he's talking about how he's personally met some of the people that are victims of violence by illegal immigrants. And so because of that, I thought that was politically very wise of the president. He's trying to appeal to both sides of the aisle. And the fact that he sort of bookended them with these two different appeals was smart because people tend to, to remember the beginning of the speech and the end of the speech the most. So this is a really great way at some some food for thought kind of for those that may still be on the fence when it comes to this particular issue. So a really wise choice by the president to bookend it this way. And it does show that sort of compassionate, sympathetic side of the argument that all too often gets forgotten about. We did have the Democrats actually offer a response to the, the president's speech there, his address to the nation, and so Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer together. One thing that I would point out before we actually get into the clip, just advice, genu genuine, friendly advice coming from me. 
if you're talking about the venue, the venue was fine. The podium was fine. Even though I'm going to disagree with some things that they actually said, don't stand right next to each other. You look like a weird married couple about to make an announcement of some kind, like the gender of your baby or something. And don't do that. Take turns. Because the shoulder to shoulder thing, trying to stand behind a podium that was really too small for the two of them, it just looks awkward. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to do the side by side, or if you're going to, to both address the country, then what needed to happen is Nancy Pelosi is out there by herself. Chuck Schumer is off camera. Then he comes in, Ch uh, Nancy moves off. And you could even tell that Nancy felt a little bit awkward there because you have uh, one person speaking and you have the other person just kind of staring into the camera. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It, it was weird. Don't have two people on camera at the same time unless they're part of the audience. So if you're going to do that, Nancy first, Chuck Schumer coming in afterward. That, that's how to handle it. But nonetheless, so it is a little awkward and you're going to pick up on that. But there's a couple of, of clips here that I want to play in their rebuttal. Sadly... Much of what we heard from President Trump throughout this sense of shutdown has been full of misinformation and even malice. The president has chosen fear. We want to start with the facts. The fact is, on the very first day of this Congress, House Democrats passed Senate Republican legislation to reopen government and fund smart, effective border security solutions. But the president is rejecting these bipartisan bills which would reopen government over his obsession with for forcing American taxpayers to waste billions of dollars on an expensive and ineffective wall, a wall he always promised Mexico would pay for. The fact is, President Trump has chosen to hold hostage critical services for the health, safety, and well-being of the American people and withhold the paychecks of 800,000 innocent workers across the nation, many of them veterans. All right, so the again, and I'm not going to rehash this because I already went through it with Doug Jones said it, and so I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, but this whole use of the term hostage and just flinging it around willy-nilly, and she uses it two or three times in this short little about four or five-minute speech. The idea that it is being held hostage, the American people are not being held hostage. About 20% of the federal government is being quote-unquote held hostage, and even then I wouldn't say that holding hostage is an appropriate way to char characterize it, and I said this when Chuck Schumer was largely the one responsible for instigating the last government shutdown. Again, it always takes both sides of the government for the government to shut down, but in that particular case, Chuck Schumer was sort of the one that instigated it in the same way that Donald Trump was kind of the one that instigated this one. Doesn't mean that they're the only ones responsible, does mean they were kind of the ones that started it. So when it comes to Chuck Schumer, even when that was the case, I still didn't use this phrase hostage. Holding hostage is stupid because it, it's under threat of harm. All the people that are not getting their paychecks, they're going to be furloughed, they're going to get back pay. If they're working without pay, they're going to be paid and compensated for that. And again, as federal workers or federal contractors, whomever we may be talking about at the time, these are people that understand it is part of the risk factor that is associated with the job, just like any other job has risk factors. The, the government could shut down and they could not have pay for a little while. I mean, that can happen with a union strike in a private business. There's all kinds of ways that the private sector also has worries that are similar to that, just in different ways. And so when we're talking about this, the holding hostage thing is overly hostile. It's obviously meant to drum up some kind of image of Donald Trump, you know, saying, if I don't get my way, then I'm going to hold this person hostage. But again, by that logic, you could also say that Nancy Pelosi is holding the country hostage because she won't give in and just give Donald Trump $5.7 billion to spend on a wall. What is happening here is that both sides have made a cost evaluation analysis. In other words, they believe that the cost of shutting the government down is less than the cost of giving in to the other side. In the Democrats' case, that would be the cost of letting the government stay shut down is less than the cost of the 5.7 for the wall, the damage that it would do to them or, or however they want to prescribe it. And then the reverse is also true of President Donald Trump. He believes that the cost that is associated with the government being shut down is actually less than the cost 
of going to the mat on this and making sure this gets done. So both sides are doing a cost evaluation and saying the government shutdown is worth this. So they're going to say and play this blame game that it's not worth it, but according to their actions and in keeping with that, logically we can deduce that both sides have actually determined that, yes, the government shutdown is worth having this fight over, because if that were not the case, then they would just give in to the other side. So let's also not forget that when Chuck Schumer instigated the government shutdown earlier this year. And again, not saying that the Republicans didn't play a part in that because they were in control as well. But when Chuck Schumer instigated a shutdown earlier this year, he said, no, if we don't get something done on DACA, then I am not going to have the Democrats approve this continuing resolution. We are not going to approve this budget. He said that and he said it over and over again. And yet then it wasn't holding hostage. And even more important to note in that, in that particular government shutdown, the military had not already been funded. So it was actually a larger government shutdown with a higher risk of people not seeing their paychecks because more employees were involved in that. A very large sector of the federal government employees, our military, would not have seen their paychecks had that shutdown continued. And it, it did for a while to where they didn't see those paychecks. But nonetheless, when that was happening, the Democrats didn't think that it was a hostage situation then. They thought that the government was worth it. And here's another thing, too. When Chuck Schumer did it, he was doing so with an issue that had nothing to do with the budget. He just wanted amnesty for the DACA kids. And even though that had absolutely nothing to do with the budget whatsoever, he was saying, you give this to me or I'm not going to vote for the budget. At least with the shutdown that is happening right now, we are arguing about funding. We are arguing about the budget. That one had nothing to do with the budget. He was just saying, you pass this bill or I'm not going to, to fund the government. And so when you're looking at it that way, it makes even less sense that it's coming from Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer that these criticisms are taking place. And when she talked about that the president was using fear, Look, some fear is good. Some fear is good. If there is a legitimate threat out there, you need to be afraid. It keeps you alert. It keeps you on your toes. It makes you aware of the severeness of the situation. If I'm in a room and I see a tiger, I should be afraid because that tiger can kill me very quickly. And so because of that, fear is a necessary thing at that point, and fear is actually going to be a good thing. If I'm apathetic or don't have fear, that can cause me to make stupid decisions that will result in me dying by the, the, the claws of a tiger. And so fear is actually a very good thing in certain situations. And it's a little hard for me to take this idea that, oh, the president is just fear-mongering and he's using fear to get his political agenda through, when we're talking about the party, that every time anybody gets shot, oh, we have to take guns away. And that's what they push over and over and over again. This is the party that ran the March for Our Lives. And we're supposed to believe that they don't use fear tactics to try to drum up. Remember, we saw the email correspondence from Rahm Emanuel in the wake of Sandy Hook saying that we need to go ahead and get this done now. And we need to talk about how uh, we need to make it personal and talk about how the American people, their children are in danger if they don't do something and pass gun control. So this idea of, well, he's just using fear to, to get his political way. Uh, yeah, the Democrats do that every time the subject of guns even comes up. And let's not forget global warming, too, to where they have this apocalyptic, catastrophic view of the way that global warming is taking place and that we're the ones that are doing it and we're the only contributing factor. And they're saying, I mean, Al Gore literally made an entire movie that was predicting the entire city of New York would be underwater by this point in history and that we would be past the point of no return. And so this is just utterly, utterly ridiculous. The idea that the Democrats, oh, our hands are clean of ever using fear to try to motivate somebody to do politically what we want. No, 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 no. You guys don't get to make that claim. And when she talked about, well, there were Republicans that passed this legislation. Look, all Nancy Pelosi did there is prove that there's an awful lot of rhinos that don't really care about border security and are in the pocket of the Chamber of Commerce. That talking point 
may move some people on the left and it may get them stirred up in a frenzy, but it's not going to move people on the right. And it's not going to move even the moderate people that understand that most of the Republicans in the house and Senate are not actually conservatives. And so I don't think that politically that that point's going to make any difference. So let's go ahead and look at the rest of Nancy Pelosi's rebuttal there. The fact is, we all agree we need to secure our borders while honoring our values. We can build the infrastructure and roads at our ports of entry. Oh, oh, we can build the roads at the points of entry. So that's why all those illegal immigrants are coming over. It makes perfect sense. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. They're like, man, that road has potholes. I'm not coming in that way. I'm going to climb over the fence. I'm going to go across this big open area where there's not a fence. Man, why didn't I think of that if we just fix the roads? Man, that solves the illegal immigration process all the, altogether. Instead of sneaking across the border, they're just going to come across the legal points of entry because the roads are so much nicer. What does that have anything to do with border security? I mean, Nancy Pelosi does get into some other things that she wants to fund that actually do make sense, which, by the way, are included in Trump's proposal of $5.7 billion, so I don't see what the sticking point is there. She's not offering an alternative. She's just saying that these are the things that we'd like to see done. Well, you can have those things. Those things are included in Trump's plan. You can go ahead and do that. But the funny thing to me is that she just talks about roads like – Roads are the problem, and somehow fixing roads at the legal points of entry, that's going to be what solves illegal immigration. <laughs> you want to talk about it? I'm not saying that we don't need to, to worry about that. I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that. That is the federal government's responsibility, especially at a, a legal point of entry. But let's not pretend that that's going to have any effect whatsoever on illegal immigration. All right, let's go to the next clip. The fact is... The women and children at the border are not a security threat. They are a humanitarian challenge, a challenge that President Trump's own cruel and counterproductive policies have only deepened. And the fact is, President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis, and must reopen the government. All right, so again, you hear the hostage language. Again, she says it all the time in this particular short speech. But this line that, well, the women and children, they're not a security threat. Well, first of all, when we're talking about the women and children that are trying to get across the border, they actually are a security threat. I mean, we've seen female terrorists, for example. They could be a security threat. In San Bernardino, that shooting, that was an illegal immigrant. That was not an illegal immigrant, but that was somebody that was a terrorist that happened to be a woman. And so let's not pretend that just because a woman is a woman, that there's absolutely no chance that she's a security threat at all. I mean, there's a reason that you have to screen everybody when you go through airport security at the TSA. Because if all of a sudden we just stop screening women, we're like, ah, women, they're fine. There's no chance that they're going to do anything wrong or illegal. Well, then what would happen? The terrorists would immediately start sending through the women. And so you can't really make that assertion. And I do think it's funny that Nancy Pelosi, who is this big advocate for equality of women and women's rights and supposed to be this feminist hero, that she's the one that are saying uh, – her feminist buddies are the ones that are saying men and women are exactly equal. There's no difference, and she's the one making the case when it suits her. Oh, well, it's, it's just women. Women can't do anything wrong. Women are not a security threat. Women and children, they're not – Again, that's really the problem that you're running into. And not all illegal immigrants are women and children. You remember that when we were looking at that migrant caravan, that it was not only Amy Horowitz with PragerU, but also a journalist that repeatedly on different days on different broadcasts that was with MSNBC reporting on this saying, yeah, it's about 95% men, 90 to 95% men. There's not a lot of families here. They're here, but they're the minority. It's mostly guys, a bunch of single guys coming across the border. And so let's not pretend that the women and children are the only ones trying to get through the border. And if they are legitimate asylum seekers, and I'm assuming that there are quite a few that are, if we're talking about women and children, families that are legitimately seeking asylum in the United States because they are in fear for their life, okay, that's a conversation we can have. Border wall wouldn't affect them. Wouldn't affect them. 
Because if they are legitimately seeking asylum, all they have to do is go to a legal point of entry, claim that they want to seek asylum, and they will be brought in through a legal process. Those people are not illegal immigrants, and the border wall would not affect them in any way. So this argument that she's making that the women and children are not a, a are, are not a security threat. Well, if you're talking about asylum seekers, then the border wall doesn't affect them anyway. You're conflating two completely different things, and that's an unfortunate problem that the Democrats have is that they constantly are unable to recognize a difference between legal immigrants and illegal immigrants. I run in very conservative circles. I do not know a single conservative that is against legal immigration. They are only against illegal immigration. And so you're conflating two things that do not have anything to do with one another. And what she says there, actually, I do agree with part of it. There is a humanitarian crisis. There are people that are coming across these vast spans of, of desert and risking their lives and their children's lives. We've seen some of the, the tragedies that have happened because of that. And you know what solves that problem? Getting rid of the incentives to come here. So that means getting rid of sanctuary cities, getting rid of the welfare state, cracking down on employers that hire illegal immigrants. And it means securing the border. In part, not exclusively, but in part, with a physical structure, a border wall. And so if you're talking about this humanitarian crisis, I agree with Nancy Pelosi that there's a humanitarian crisis down there. There is a humanitarian problem down on the border. But the best way to solve that, the best way to limit human suffering in doing that is to create a physical barrier, which is the case that Donald Trump made just minutes before she did. And while she just kind of said it and made the claim, Donald Trump, even though this is rare that Donald Trump does this, he actually backed it up with facts and statistics to explain why this is a humanitarian crisis that needs a secure border to solve it. So let's go ahead and look at the next part of this. This is part of Chuck Schumer's response. American democracy doesn't work that way. We don't govern by temper tantrum. No president should pound the table and demand he gets his way or else the government shuts down, hurting millions of Americans who are treated as leverage. Democrats and the president both want stronger border security. However, we sharply disagree with the president about the most effective way to do it. So, how do we untangle this mess? Well, there's an obvious solution. Separate the shutdown from arguments over border security. All right, for the 10,000th freaking time, we are not a democracy. We have never been a democracy. You cannot find the word democracy in any of our founding documents. We are a constitutional republic. But I'm not going to get off on that right now. I know it's just something stupid that Chuck Schumer says every freaking time he opens his mouth that somehow we're a democracy, but we're not. Anyway, that being <laughs> set aside... Uh, got triggered there for a second. No, I'm kidding. Uh, by that standard, though, the standard that Chuck Schumer has just presented, then you govern by temper tantrum and you dig your heels in. Because, again, it takes two parties to shut it down. And keep in mind that you were the instigator of the previous government shutdown where you dug your heels in and said, nope, I am not going to pass this budget until DACA goes through. And so there is just such a hypocrisy here. I would love to see at least one politician that is saying, look, we're having a disagreement on this, and because of that, the government is shut down. If the other side wants to capitulate and wants to admit that this is not worth the government shutdown, then that's great, and I'll give them praise for that. But the point is, when it comes to this, this is a fight that is worth having. I would love to see a politician actually say that. But here's Chuck Schumer playing this song and dance where he's trying to blame the president, even though he's done exactly the same thing in the past and apparently didn't have a problem with it then. And this is really the issue that you're running into. There is such a double standard here. And like I said before, at least with this particular shutdown, we are dealing with a situation where it actually does have to do with the budget. When you instigated a government shutdown, Chuck Schumer's reason and rationale for it was, I want something, I want amnesty for the DACA kids. 
well, yeah, but that has nothing to do with the budget. doesn't matter. I'm not going to go ahead and sign along with the budget until I get amnesty for the DACA kids. So his wasn't even related to spending. And yet he's the one that is going after Donald Trump for this one. All right, let's go to, um, sorry, uh, having some technical issues. Okay, this is the last piece, uh, last little bit of Chuck Schumer's response. The symbol of America should be the Statue of Liberty, not a 30-foot wall. All right, so this is, in my opinion, the best takeaway line from the entire night, because here's the thing. It's like Chuck Schumer... Well, actually, I know that that's what he's doing. He is relying on the ignorance of the masses. He's saying that the Statue of Liberty, this big welcoming symbol, that ought to be the symbol of America. Again, there is a huge difference in legal immigration and illegal immigration. That's what the whole debate is about. Got no problem with legal immigrants. Got a real problem with illegal immigrants. And if what Chuck Schumer is saying is that that should be the symbol and that should be the beacon to illegal immigrants, then I have a real problem because he's basically saying, come all ye illegals, come on in and we'll take care of you. No, 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 no. That's the problem is that he's being exposed as the open borders radical that he really is, which is a really stark contrast from him voting for more fencing, 700 miles worth of it, in 2006. And what's hilarious about this is he's trying to bring about this image of the Statue of Liberty as this big welcoming beacon. Yeah, where's the Statue of Liberty? In New York City, in the harbor, atop a massive natural barrier on a border, the ocean. The reason that we don't have border walls on our oceans is because you don't need them. It's a giant natural barrier. And so what's hilarious about this is he's saying that the wall shouldn't be the symbol of America. The freaking Statue of Liberty sits on top of a border security measure. <laughs> we didn't put it there. It's the ocean. It occurred naturally. But the point is, it is a giant natural barrier that prevents people from getting into our the, the borders of our country. And so it's so hilarious that he makes that case, even though the Statue of Liberty clearly is sort of symbolic of, of people coming into the country legally and sits across a natural border that keeps the people out that are not supposed to be here illegally, at least ideally. And it also sits next to a giant legal point of entry, Ellis Island. And so that symbolism of the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of legal immigration, not illegal immigration. And if you want further proof of this, let's keep in mind that the tablet in the hand of Lady Liberty is supposed to be a tablet that represents the laws of Moses. It's not the law of Moses, but it's supposed to be symbolic of that. So the rule of law is supposed to be adhered to according to the symbolism in the Statue of Liberty. And what is inscribed on that tablet? A couple of different lines from a poem. We'll read a couple of these. Here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand, and then I lift my lamp behind the golden door. So, sunset gates, golden door. In other words, because you can't have a door just standing out in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't mean anything. The Statue of Liberty stands for a wall, an exclusatory area that is separated by a barrier, a border, and a door. In other words, if you want to come in, you got to come in through the door. You got to come in through the gate. You come through legally. And this is the thing that Democrats seem to have a real problem with, is that they're trying to get open borders. They want more illegals to come over. They want this sort of open border because they're breeding voters and, and being able to turn different states at least purple, if not blue, with the changing demographics. And yet, they're trying to present it as, well, the, the Republicans are just against legal immigration. We should be for the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, if you're for the Statue of Liberty, then you're for legal immigration and keeping everybody that is illegal out, because that's fair to the citizen, and it's also fair to the legal immigrant that actually went through and did it the right way. So Democrats have been conflating these two for years, but if you're looking at it honestly and looking at it through the correct lens, you're for legal immigration, or you're for legal immigration, you're just against the people that are trying to jump over the border, jump over the gate, go around that golden door that Lady Liberty is talking about. 
that's the people that we're having a problem with. And that's the ones that you guys don't seem to be on board with trying to keep out of the country and doing everything we can to make sure they don't come through, through an illegal process. All right. So we're going to go ahead and go to the daily dose of stupid. Who messed it up? <laughs> You're stupid. <laughs> All right, today's Daily Dose of Stupid, and it looks like we have a phone call, so we'll get to that right after the Daily Dose of Stupid. Um, I did I did think that this was actually pretty hilarious. Um, we've got a clip here of the witches having a real problem with Trump. And no, you did not hear me incorrectly. There are witches, and I'm talking actual witches, that have a problem with Donald Trump. Take a listen. Are you a witch? I'm a practicing witch. That's how I make my living, yes. And which kind of witch are you? Uh, I'm initiated into Wicca, which is the religious side of things. Witches tend to side with liberals. And you know what they wish President Trump would stop saying about the Mueller investigation? It's a witch hunt. That's all it is. The witch hunt, as I call it. Russian witch hunt. This is a witch hunt like nobody's ever seen before. The author of witchcraft activism calls the president's use of the term. It's really disgraceful. I mean, thousands of people were executed in Europe on suspicion of witchcraft. Closer to home, there were the Salem witch trials. I saw Bridget Bishop with the devil. Nineteen supposed witches were hanged. There's a lot to be offended by by Donald Trump, and I think you, his use of the term witch hunt is, is very low on that list of priorities for most witches. But nevertheless, it does demonstrate his ignorance as usual. Uh, so apparently this is the big problem with Donald Trump. The witches are offended and he shouldn't be using the word witch hunt because it's offending the witches and the witches are triggered by it. Now, I I'm going to be honest about this. A lot of people were saying that CNN is upset about this. I kind of saw this segment as being tongue in cheek and just something that's kind of goofy and interesting. I don't think this is necessarily the view of CNN. I think it's just something kind of funny that they decided to do because even the reporter there is doing it a little bit tongue in cheek. And so it's just kind of sillier and ridiculous. Now I do think it's fair to say as as some people have probably pointed out before me, I, I think that this is an original thought, but maybe someone else has gotten to the point before I did. Would they have done this with Obama? No. If there were a bunch of witches that had issues with president Obama, they wouldn't have covered it. So it is fair to say that there's at least somewhat of a double standard, but I do think this is just a sort of a, a ridiculous, silly one because I don't think CNN is actually taking this either. Uh, I would point out that the one lady says, yes, I am a witch. I, that's how I make my living. How do you make a living as a witch? Are you like out selling voodoo dolls out of your van? Like, how does that, how does that work? I don't really understand how she's making her living being a witch, but nonetheless, um, here's the thing. I don't understand why they're upset because he's actually using the term correctly. Because you just heard, and, and they were talking about it in that CNN report, that there were actual witches that were hanged on suspicion of being a witch. And when I say witch, of course, I don't you know, actually believe in it, but there are people that attempt practicing witchcraft. But there are people that were actually hanged on accusations of being a witch. But the way that Donald Trump is using it, he's acknowledging that that was wrong and that it's also wrong to come after him because he's not a witch. It's also wrong to come after him because he didn't really collude with Russia. And so in the way that he's using that term, it really shouldn't be offensive to witches. If anything, it should sound like the president is vindicating them of wrongdoing in the past when witches were persecuted against. And so I really don't understand what they're upset about. If anything, this is kind of a compliment to him that President Trump is saying, look, I'm innocent and I believe that I'm innocent and I don't think that there's anything here. And just like there wasn't anything here with me, there wasn't anything there when the witches were being accused and, and wound up getting hanged for being witches. And so that's what's so hilarious about that is if you're looking at the way that he's using the phrase and the context in which he's using it, actually, if anything, it ought to be considered flattering that the president is using the term witch hunt. But I guess that you can't expect that somebody that believes that they can actually perform witchcraft to be somebody that's much of a logical thinker. So I think that that's kind of a moot point at that, that time. But um, like most things, I think that they're just looking for one more thing to nitpick. 
All right. It looks like we have somebody on the phones. Good morning. What's your name? Hey, good morning. It's John. Hey. Yeah. So what's on your mind this morning? Just wanted to point out that I think secretly the media, which by all that, that study such things agree that the liberal the media is liberal. And sure. I you think secretly that they actually love having Trump in the White House with regard to their job because it gives them so much to do and it's so much fun for them to do that? Well, it certainly helps their ratings, so I think they're cl- they're glad about that, if nothing else. I mean, you're looking at the ratings of MSNBC and CNN before Donald Trump was elected, and they were uh, pretty lackluster, and they've gone up considerably since Trump has been in office. That's what I mean, I, it, it, because they salivated over him when he was running. Oh, absolutely. And they couldn't. He couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't say anything. It didn't make any difference what it was. Uh, he didn't have to spend that much on his campaign because it was all free. Oh yeah, I mean he, he was got... continually in the news every day, all day long because he was running, and he didn't have to spend nearly as much as I've forgotten. You you know the figures probably, but he didn't have well, to spend nearly as much as as. Hillary did. I, I did back in the campaign, but I've long since forgotten a lot of those figures. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, it's been a couple of years now, and it feels like an eternity. So I don't have those figures off the top of my head. But it was a considerable amount of free advertising that he got that none of his opponents, including Hillary Clinton, got. Now, granted, most of it was negative, but the point is, his name got out there an awful lot. Sure. And another thing too, I think the best commentary that I heard on that, and to your point. And this is a little bit crass, but I think it gets the point across. Uh, I, there was, um, I cannot remember which commentator said this, because like I said, it's been a couple years now. But they said the media and Trump are like a couple that talk about how much they hate each other until eventually at the end of the movie, they wind up having angry sex. And, you know, even though that is a little bit crass, it does kind of get the point across that they sort of have this odd love hate relationship with one another. They talk about how much they despise one another and yet they kind of need each other and they sort of thrive off of the conflict. Absolutely. So, well, let's have a good one. All right. Thank you much. Yeah. Have a good one. All right. um, We're going to go ahead and go to the chaplain's report. Eventually. There it goes. Maybe. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's report this morning comes from the book of Daniel. We're continuing our series on Daniel. And for those of you who haven't been paying attention or just didn't catch the chaplain's report yesterday for whatever reason, Daniel and his friends have been praying for their lives. So the king is angry. He's mad that nobody can interpret his dream. And because he is angry and because the magicians and the wise men have failed him, he's decided, you know what? I'm just going to off all of them. Just going to take all of them out. And then Daniel steps up and says, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Why is he going to kill all of us? And he says, because nobody can interpret his dream. And he tells him the situation. Daniel goes, oh, I'll do it. I can interpret dreams. That'll be fine. And so when that happens, Daniel and his friends get together and pray that, um, that he'll be able to do this, that he'll be able to interpret the king's dream and that he'll be able to save everyone's life. And that's really where we end up. And so that's kind of setting the stage for this particular verse in Daniel 2, 19 through 23, where he offers this prayer. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes with the times and epochs. He removes the kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he it is he that reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light that dwells within him. To you, O God, of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what is requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. 
so what we see here is David giving a praise of uh, giving a prayer of praise and a praise of of thanksgiving. So what he starts out with, if you're looking at that particular prayer that he offers, God has revealed this thing to him. He is very grateful for it. He recognizes that only God could do this. That's something that we talked about that even the Chaldeans realize, that no man could just know the king's dream and know the interpretation, and it would require a God to do so. And that's exactly who Daniel went to. He got together with his friends and prayed that this interpretation would take place, and then it was revealed to him in a night vision. And so because of that, Daniel is giving praise to God and his power for being able to do this, where it talks about all wisdom and power belongs to him, and it is you who changes the times and epochs and removes kings. See, that's the thing. Daniel gets who's in charge. Daniel understands it. He knows that it's not him, and it's not Nebuchadnezzar. He understands that God sent Nebuchadnezzar this dream, and then he sent the interpretation of this dream to Daniel. God is up there pulling all the strings. Not as though he's a puppet master that he's forcing anybody to do this, but through his divine providence, he is making things work out for the good of all by allowing these things to take place. He's working for the good of Nebuchadnezzar and for Daniel, and that's the way that he works in our lives. That it's not as though he's, when I say he's pulling the strings, it's not as though he is manipulating us into something that we have to do, but he is setting us up for things. He is setting us up for success, and not just to benefit ourselves, but to benefit all of those around us. And that's exactly what God is doing with even the pagans surrounding him, like the Chaldeans or King Nebuchadnezzar. He is working good through Daniel and allowing him to display his mighty power to everybody else. And because of that, Daniel understands where these gifts of dream interpretation really come from, and that it's not King Nebuchadnezzar that's really in charge. God is really the one calling the shots here. And he also gives in verse 22 this acknowledgement of his infinite wisdom, talking about how he reveals these amazing, profound, hidden things. And another thing that he talks about, too, that is really fascinating is he says at the end of verse 22, and the light dwells with him. Not that he dwells in the light or that he is the, the creator of light, all of which would have been true, but he's saying the light dwells with him. So what I'm questioning here is prophecy? Because we know that, especially in the Gospel of John, Jesus is referred to the light over and over again. That is a name that is given to the Christ. And he says, light dwells with him as though it was some kind of living being or some kind of entity. Is Daniel here asserting, even though he may not even have realized it when he was doing so, is he giving a prophecy also about the Christ? That he's saying, this is a God who light dwells with him, Sounds to me like at least it's possible you could read it this way, that he's also talking about acknowledging the existence of his son in this prayer. And since Daniel is a prophet, then it would certainly be appropriate for him to do that, even if he didn't realize he was doing it at the time. And Daniel is also thankful. You'll notice at the end there in verse 23, he's talking about he's giving all this thanks and praise for all the mighty things and wonderful things that God has done in this, he understands that God is the reason he was able to receive this vision. God is the reason he's able to save himself and his friends and all the magicians. And because of that, he owes a debt of gratitude to God the Father. So you see that in all things, Daniel prayed. Originally, when he heard this was going on, he and his friends got together and prayed for help. And then when the thing was accomplished and God did what was requested of him, in the prayers of Daniel and his three friends, then he comes and he prays for praise and thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for all the amazing things that he's done. And so that really is, I think, a model for us to follow. That when we're about to go through something big, we pray. When God helps us through it, we don't forget. We also pray then. A lot of times, especially when we're desperate, we remember to pray and ask for God's help then. But sometimes we forget to say a prayer of thank you when he's gotten us through it. And so I think the model here is that we need to constantly be in a mode of prayer, that we constantly need to be in contact with God as one of his children. And that's something that Daniel understands and acknowledges, and he lives his life that, that way. And that is the way that we as Christians need to live our life as well. We need to lead a life where prayer is an integral part of everything we do. Stay the course, friends.